Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm happy to welcome um, Sven Havemann from Graz University of Technology. Um, he will be talking about shape grammars and recursive refinement, limitations and extensions. Sven. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael, and especially thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here a little bit um, about these things. I'm coming, approaching things from a completely opposite side. I come from procedural modeling. So um, we have just recently gone into also shape um, structure detection, but I'm primarily um, uh, focusing on uh, structure generation. And I would like to start this talk, uh, so first of all introduce the group. So this is the procedural modeling group at CGV uh, in Graz, and of course this is the work that I'm presenting today, primarily from Uli Krispel and Wolfgang Taller. And let me start this talk by my favorite uh, quote from Hans-Peter Seidel, which I think has nicely put together the uh, idea behind visual computing or the mission statement. The objective of visual computing is to obtain an editable digital representation of the real world. And of course, the small word editable makes a huge difference because um, that poses the question, what are the suitable degrees of freedom? Um, we have 3D from measurements, we have 3D from modeling, um, all kinds of 3D, and uh, of course, the big problem is how can we parameterize this stuff? And there's already 20 ways to parameterize something as simple as a box. But um, I would like to phrase this in three sub-problems, which is first encoding shape structure, decoding shape structure, and then editing shape structure. The first, um, we need a formal language for describing shape um, in, to describe a meta design. A meta design is more, so in, in this terms, a design is a specific shape. A meta design is a whole shape family. And then the inverse problem is given an, a shape instance, what are its structure and parameters? Yeah? And finally, um, it might be that the um, detected degrees of freedom are not quite what the user actually expects for editing the shape. So this um, defines also the talk outline. And first of all, I would like to um, talk about encoding shape structure. So um, here I give you an example of uh, yeah, some of the work that we did in the past. Um, when you look at this shape, um, it has basically the pointed Gothic arch has this structure, here, so you can de decompose it into, so it has this nice recursive structure, and uh, you can then fill this recursive part in different way, also use the same as you use in the big window and the sub windows, etc., etc. And here are uh, shown just two of the shape parameters. Yeah? And of course, uh, this particular window is based on compass and ruler constructions, and it has many degrees of freedom. And um, so uh, we're doing this uh, with a, in, a, in lots of ways. Here the comparison between round arch and pointed arch, high technology from the 12th century, um, completely different stuff. How do you parameterize a chair? Uh, so here are some redundant degrees of freedom of a chair. Uh, then uh, I have this car rim model uh, where you can obviously um, increase the number of uh, um, uh, Speichen rods, spokes, exactly. So what's happening here? Um, and finally, we also use this, for instance, for a cave configurator, yeah, which is a, also a difficult problem. We have this cave actually in, in Graz. And uh, at a certain point, I was asked whether uh, how large the mirrors would be uh, that you need um, to uh, project the images. Uh. Okay, so um, 
this is what I'm coming from. Um, this is um, the Wikipedia page on the generative modeling language. It shows you a little bit the principle behind all this. Um, so first of all, first line um, creates a quadrangle. Um, parameters are put on a stack. Operators can take things from the stack, um, create geometry, and return the results. We can um, uh, we have extended this to operate on half edges, so we're doing really mosh mi mesh modeling using this kind of uh, weird language, which is actually derived or practically identical to a postscript. Anyways, um, obviously what you see here is many numbers, and when you change those numbers, you can also change the model, and that gives you the parametrization that I was talking about, and the structure um, is defined by the sequence of operations. So that is very general. Um, and we can do all kinds of different models with this. So this is a didactic applet that is supposed to show you in one model a V engine, a boxer engine, and a row engine. And you can change the sliders. Um, so the car rim model was actually created by mental reverse engineering by a bachelor student who got 32 uh, car rims from uh, Volkswagen and partitioned them into three parametric models which were then parameterized in a suitable way to actually reproduce each and every instance. Um, a completely different thing, um, so Johann Kaiser ring manufacturer number three in the German wedding ring market gave us those uh, wedding rings and we have parameterized them and um, decomposed them into parametric and procedural shape building blocks and these are some of the results and Johann Kaiser was quite surprised that they could actually manufacture even more rings than they thought. Um, finally this is for interactive shape design for mass customization. Um, here we have this lamp designer uh, kind of thing which you can 3D print out. Um, the aspect that is most important here maybe is the separation of structure from style. So you look at these little decorations here, which are applied to the same base mesh. And of course, you can, as you would expect, apply this to any other um, regular mesh structure yeah? <coughs> by suitable separation of library functions from the structure. So when you have well-structured procedural models, like the chair, um, with the chair, I unintendedly also created a couch, a bed, a bench, a child stool, so all kinds of different stools and also invalid stools, of course, which are not part of the uh, shape space of, um, of stools, actually. And um, since we are in um, Cambridge, um, I would like to give also this example, which I did not plan in uh, Initially, um, if I had stayed, in, if, if I was a student in Cambridge, I would have gone into procedural modeling of all these beautiful buildings. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. However, these are is basically the result of applying 92,000, as you can see here, 92,000 Euler operators. And this is what I mean by structure. Okay, so I think this is a little bit... Um, yeah, so what I mean by uh, I'm coming from the opposite side. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in Cambridge with respect to um, architecture, but in Graz. And this is the computer science building in Graz. Um, actually, it's not such a bad building. Um, what we did was uh, we made a case study. So this is basically the faculty of computer science in Graz. And um, the interesting thing here is the notion of the qualitative model. Uh, all rooms are present, all um, doors are present, all buildings elements, but we have not necessarily measured everything, but we can measure everything any time later. And um, now here you see what I'm talking about today. Actually, these are shape grammars. Um, this is the refinement of the interior. And if I switch just back and forth, you see that by changing the last terminal rules, we can actually uh, switch the notion of filled and empty space to show the publicly accessible spaces. And this shows and displays the concept of semantic views. Yeah? So we can encode different semantics in this. Here is um, yeah, the basic uh, operations of 
shaped grammars are split and subdivide. And here you see the GML version of that. Um, with a split operator, you give an, uh, an array of um, values. So you have the size and the number of the parameters. Whereas with subdivision, you either specify the number or the size, and uh, you get the other one. Um, so that's basically split and subdivide, OK? That sets the scene. Now here, we have grammar rules. Um, so this is um, probably you would expect something like Bacchus Nauer. But um, this is a clear transformation from Bacchus Nauer form. Um, so for instance, um, you have the terminal box, the terminal void. Um, so it's empty space or filled space. And um, for instance, the rule G would give you in Z direction, as you can see here, rule G in Z direction, zero, 10 centimeters, whatever remains, 10 centimeters, split in Z direction, filled by AAA, which is a box. Yeah? And then you have F, which is a box, empty box, also in Z direction. And then you have rule E, which goes to rules G, G and F and G, in, uh, in alternating ways, so you first apply that one, then that one, then that one, which gives you this. And but using this, you can very concisely describe this recursive structure. So this is a simple syntax transformation, Bacchus Nauer to GML. And uh, what GML actually does is when T is executed, uh, PQR is executed instead. And um, so this is a simple string replacement you can think of, yeah? And this works really fine for all deterministic context-free grammars. Speaking of deterministic context-free grammars, uh, there are three grammar types to distinguish. So first of all, there's context-free grammars, which have Bacchus Nauer form like this. Then there's context-sensitive grammars, and the important thing here is that things can also shrink. Yeah, you can take away symbols, which gives you a great deal of flexibility, which um, curiously nobody is using, because it is really difficult to control. Context-sensitive grammars um, can do really interesting stuff. Um, and also, usually you use grammars for accepting words, but in this case, we're using it for generating words. Now, the third and uh, most powerful um, grammar type is the graph grammar, graph rewriting systems. Um, so you have the, a graph on the one side and a graph on the other side. And this is actually Turing complete. You can create a Turing machine with it. So then you have immediately all problems you would like to have, like the halting problem, incomputability of Kolmogorov complexity, just to mention. Right? So can we do without Turing completeness? That's the, that's the big big issue. Yeah? We have context-free, but context-free has problems. And I would like to um, just talk a little bit about the problems. First of all, um, Steiny in 72 has uh, proposed the shape grammars. Yeah? And shape grammars, very, very general, say we have something that we, re we replace by a number of some things, yeah? and, and everything is labeled. And over the labels, you create the, the grammar rules. And that was used for 30 years for analysis of uh, architecture, but not actually for creation of architecture. Until in 2006, um, Pascal Müller and his uh, colleagues um, from ETH Zurich um, have had this seminal contribution, procedural modeling of buildings, where they introduced the notion of a scope, basically a box. Yeah, you have a box. So re the, the interesting thing is, the whole thing gets use, useful by limitation, by limitation, yeah? Um, you have only split, subdivide, and component split, which gives you the sides of a box, so two-dimensional, one-dimensional, zero-dimensional. Um, and the CGA shape, um, grammar description language, is uh, very similar to Bacchus Nauer, uh, was then built into the city engine, which is now a commercial product. Now, about the limitation. The biggest limitation is that the whole process is really recursive. So something is split, something is further split, something is further split. So the grandchildren don't know each other. There's no information exchange between the grandchildren. That's um, a, a, great, um, uh, a great achievement because people 
love that uh, shape grammars actually localize the shape construction process. You only have to worry what happens in your box. Yeah? You cannot communicate to other boxes. Impossible, for instance, adjust the parent so that all children fit into it. There's no upwards uh, communication. Another, um, so uh, CGA shape from Pascal Müller used pre-modeled assets, which makes their models really look beautiful because they have these beautiful towers, these beautiful uh, columns, etc., etc. Um, but um, this leads to disconnected models. Paolo Cignoni has had lots of fun uh, in, in actually rendering these models uh, consisting of millions of parts, like virtual Pompeii. Yeah? So there's, there's special algorithms for putting it everything uh, together again. And um, for instance, model consistency is difficult to enforce. If uh, there's no horizontal information exchange, how would you make things match? Yeah? For instance, in this part, um, no matter whether you first split vertically or horizontally, it is, strictly speaking, a coincidence that both of these red lines really uh, go through the whole model because every instance is just created in its box. Okay? Another uh, interesting thing is that um, should we allow extrusions? Like, look at the windowsill, which is this part here, and it slightly sticks out of the facade. Yeah? So usually we have the containment property, meaning that the sub-boxes are a partition of the parent box. If we really stick to that, then for creating this little stick out, we would have to create a thin plane in front of the facade. And, 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 uh, yeah? so, so. But if we give up on this, uh, we can have intersecting parts, overlapping parts. Another interesting implication is um, that if you want to do a low-level cha detail change, then you sometimes have to change the whole rule hierarchy, like this. Yeah? So um, if I want to create this little E over there, then I have to change the floor rule, then I have to change the top-level rule to take into account that updated floor rule. Yeah? So in terms of software engineering, it can be a nightmare. Um, in, in GML, just to, I, I don't want to get into this uh, t too much, uh, but uh, in uh, GML, what we are doing, we are, for instance, we can uh, uh, solve the problem uh, given this measured space from the parent, we can then use um, uh, uh, attributes that are directly um, being fed and inherited along the hierarchy to the children to actually compute a function instead of a rule. Yeah? So um, we can actually use dictionaries as objects in the ob object-oriented sense. So the grandchildren rules can use library function to compute the distance with respect to the corridor. No? Um, another thing I would like to show here is scripted assets. Um, so this is the construction, uh, say, using uh, more, more modern, um, more modern um, uh, split, uh, shape grammars. So to wrap up, encoding shape structure, um, we have this generative representation, which is Turing complete, um, but is still amenable to automatic generation. So we can generate GML code automatically. And split grammars have serious problems with expressiveness. Um, there are so many proposals for extensions, but actually these extensions make it then more difficult to actually match the shape. And um, this is basically the, the second part. Um, so generative surface reconstruction, you have a real shape, you have a shape template, how do they match? So in this generality, we have not, um, we have not solved it. Um, boxes have many roles, as you can see in this, uh, yeah, so um, just matching boxes is a difficult problem. Here uh, we have a, um, I would just like to show then the, uh, uh, the results from the CityFit project. Um, the goal was an 80% facade reconstruction 
from LiDAR scans. Um, and um, finally, it's a, it's a cooperation with Microsoft, Microsoft Photogrammetry. We have Microsoft in Graz as well. Konrad Kahner's group. And um, so first, we did a few manual examples like this. And finally succeeded um, in um, getting something serious. There's this Koke-Younger Kazami algorithm, uh, which is actually a parsing algorithm for context-free grammars. It's a dynamic programming approach with a drastic complexity, as you can see, basically quadratic in the number of pixels. Um, so the idea here is that we reduce the number of pixels because we um, work on a lattice. And what is the lattice? Um, the lattice is basically this. Um, so these are much fewer pip pixels on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. And um, the dynamic, dynamic programming approach um, would then compute that this structure should be combined because it gives you a better, um, better cost um, because of this, it, it, it enables the symmetry between left and right part. Whereas in the lower part, this symmetry is not apparent. And using this, we got quite nice results, I think. So this is the Paris data set. And in Graz, we have even more heterogeneous coordinates. So we get better split lines. Um, and the split lines are more reliable with our approach. And um, I would just like maybe to show the video, uh, basically, to conclude this. And uh, so this is a two-minute video. So this is the um, point cloud that was derived in, in Graz. They're also using a, a car driving through the street, taking images very much like Google Street View. And um, so the first process is, of course, the to production of autophotos. From the autophotos, we get the um, then uh, different voting schemes. So this map voting, voting for um, the different parts, like windows, like walls, like doors. And um, so these are the, the different voting schemes combined. And this goes then as input into the grid creation, uh, which is then um, further processed by the grammar. Plane segmentation. And here we have the structure parsing part where we, by the uh, cost of, um, so this is less symmetric than this one, so this gets a better score, which so automatically we favor uh, the application of the four split rules which we have defined. Oh. And uh, so here we have this dynamic programming uh, approach which is visualized. So this is the wall confidence. Window confidence, door confidence, I don't know, might just. And then here, this is the dynamic programming um, visualized. And maybe to show you this, uh, this is a very pre preliminary visualization then from only last week. Of the so it's without materials etc. But um, of the buildings in Graz, of course, we are using a volumetric representation, so uh, we could actually create also real houses, but we don't have the data for this. Oh. So uh, this is composed of convex polyhedra. Yeah, and so this basically wraps up my talk. Um, we have something very general, specialized to something much more special, which is then. Uh, makes it possible to use dynamic programming as, as a matching procedure. And of course, my research interest for the coming uh, uh, years is actually how to create matching procedures for more, more powerful um, shape representation, as I've shown you in the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sven. Other questions? So, so one question, you've shown the facades, and I know there's the, the Paris effort with the facades, but what do you think is the next thing, like where 
like the, like apart from, like next thing for like facades, like, like trees, or what, what do you think is like uh, uh, possible models are where, where grammars could work and could help rooms or no. Um, well, in fact, the, the word grammar has appeared multiple times this afternoon, and this is not without a reason, because every assembly, even if you have um, an oil tanker or whatever, yeah, is composed of parts that refine. And um, it is only a matter of finding the right formal level to actually describe this in a convenient way. Yeah? Um, and for instance, this, these boxes, um, it are completely a car engine is created in a course to fine manner, yeah. But of course, boxes are not a suitable representation for that. But of course, we could also use the mesh modeling together with the shape grammars. And I would just like to to position this message, yeah, that shape grammars can be used in a very flexible way because actually it's a restricted form of depth first evaluation of functions. There's no loops in there. Um, so, so we actually, uh, it's, it's very much like programming. And that's also what, what people complain about, like architectures trying to use shape grammars. Interestingly, um, um, people love now, uh, architects love now to actually edit um, data flow graphs. Data flow graphs have become the big hype in the architectures community. I can only recommend looking up rhinoceros or grasshopper, um, there are really beautiful models out there. Yeah. But, it, but it's basically a very similar formalism. We can also use shape grammars on, on, um, on data flow graphs. Yeah. Other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Sven and all the speakers of this session again.